I remember watching this in the, in the movies and like people went ape. Everybody would be terrified of shooting that cape on set. The render engine is very photorealistic, but all of the texture work is stylized. Okay, hold up though. How did they film that? Yeah, yeah, this is awesome. Hey, how's it going? Welcome back to another episode of Visual Effects Artists React. We are joined by two special guests today. We got Joe Farrell on the couch and Clint. You remember him? Joe Farrell is a master of VFX supervision. He worked on movies such as Shang-Chi, he did Wolf of Wall Street, Transformers. I wrote about a couple of movies. Yeah. Among other movies. Yeah. We're just excited to have you back, man. Thanks, man. I really enjoy hanging out with you guys. I think I remembered last time I mentioned it's very therapeutic for me to come here. So uh, let's keep going with this. This session is free. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, Moon Knight is a brand new show out on Disney Plus. It's based in the Marvel Universe. There's some really cool stuff going on here. There's a lot of really awesome double reflection VFX going on. I think the suit is entirely VFX. I believe so. Most Wait, really? That's a real guy wearing a real suit. There wouldn't be any reason. That would cost more money to make it digital than it would be to have a real suit. Now they might be doing his head. It's definitely not a like, stunt guy. Tell me he's not full CG right there. That was definitely full CG right there. And then that's, that's real, that and then real. that's real. Yeah, you can yeah. see it in the sub texture on his shoulder there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So for me, what I'm seeing is all of the high detail in the cloth itself. There's a little bit of wrinkling going on, but there's also like this bump texture that when it cuts to the wide CG shot here, Maybe it's there and I'm just not seeing it, but it just kind of seems a little too smooth. So it's an interesting uh, example because that is definitely a real person wearing it. Although they're probably wearing some degree of head, but what it would be is they'd be cutting out the eyes. You could do it without, um, but you'd want to be able to sort of track the head afterwards because it's one thing to just sort of say, all right, we'll do it all in post. But it's another thing to then spend weeks and weeks and weeks retracking the head and yeah. fixing it. You're losing time and money at that point okay. to do that. Clearly the eyes, obviously, that's digital. And you can and see the glow of the eyes on, on the actual the, yeah, brow Yeah, so it's nose. definitely digital from the neck up, but I think you'll find they have been wearing something that's white that's representing all the way around it. Look at the way the light on the bus reacts with his head. It looks perfect. Oh, it's got a little bit of a wrap. It looks perfect to me. It's also the eyes are moving and manipulating and getting a performance. And there's a very good chance you would put that, a real practical thing on and be like, <laughs> and people are like, I, I can't hear him. There's a hell of a punch back there. Okay, hold up though. How did they film that? We're looking at the reflection of a, of a person and the real person. And that's not too hard to do. It's just simply like rotoscope out his hand and head and whatnot and do the same performance twice. You marry them together. But the camera is moving back and forth. And now you're having to replicate the exact same camera move for both performances. And you can do that with like a motion control rig. You couldn't bring a motion control rig on for one shot. You could maybe bring it on for a huge stunt sequence and plan ahead. But this one here, there's too much of this that would have been coming up. And how they're doing it is they're just shooting him. On the right. Uh, they're shooting him on the right for a performance. And the bus is just as is on the inside or they got a blue so The bus is just as is. They've rotated around his hand. Yeah. And then what they do is they now go and shoot the inverse that happens on the reflections. And now they need to calculate where the camera is and they need to then invert that. And they may have simply have shot that performance on the left hand side. They could have done it the same day. The human body is a lot of, there's like a 15% like flexibility in the perspective of what a human body can get away with and that amount of parallax that's happening in there is not enough for it to be thrown off so maybe they're doing a little bit of movement they've got a little bit of float happening on the inverse camera he's probably shot on a, a, a solid black duvetine mm -hmm. he wouldn't be on a blue screen uh, be my guess because why bother you know you could just spotlight him down and so that no it's a completely separate shot the reason being is I'm not sure about the focus if you start at the very beginning of the shot their heads are right where Oscar's reflection is. And I don't believe they're crystal sharp. You can watch him pull out of focus there. When he turns, they rack mm -hmm. out and so on. And I'm sure that, you know, the, the VFX soup is, is paying close attention, but this could be an example of sort of, well, the story needs to be told yeah. and you need to be able to see his performance. And this is just the way it is. Uh, and so sometimes, you know, we'll push VFX just to tell the story enough that 
um, we might lean him in a little bit sharper than you would normally have done to have told the story as 100% photoreal. Where would the reflections position be in the focus plane of things? I'm yeah, very confused as to where that would be. It would be as if it's that far away on the other side. It's the distance that the, the subject is from the glass. I see, I see. The real actor's a foot away from the reflection. Yes. You need to focus a foot beyond the glass. Correct. So basically your, your focus moves through that yeah. And it will put him in focus, but he, he in the foreground would go out of focus. Go out, yeah. I think there's also a very underappreciated element here, and that's the fact that they're removing the real reflection of Oscar Isaac's performance on the right. Here's probably what they're doing for that, because there's a good chance that the camera and the rig and all that sort of stuff would f appear in the shot. My guess is that he, there's no glass there at all. I was going to suggest and that, that he's yeah. slapping his hand on something that's probably down in the bottom left corner, and then they're, they're just removing that out of the frame, and then you're putting the real reflection in there. Um, what about the bus people? Well, they're real. There's no glass there. So they're really in there and it's yeah. a real insight. The reflection of the building you're seeing and the real reflection is all digital. Yeah, we had to do that a lot on Shang-Chi where you've got reflections. So basically the rule of thumb was when you're inside the object um, that's got glass, you keep those reflections. And when you're outside looking in, you remove the glass and you, you'd keep those and you put the reflections outside are fake. That was the best way of doing it as far as figuring it out. So here, they're outside so they can replicate what we're not seeing behind us. Mm. So that's digital. Oscar Isaac's reflection performance is digital. Wait, did he just start transforming? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, so on top of all of that, right, you got mummy mode. That's just good choreography, the timing up of this performance. I don't envy the task of having to do that. Like a costume coming out of nowhere, yeah. always hard work. There's definitely a dude really in there, definitely running around punching people, and he's probably wearing some form of that costume. Oh, yeah. He's wearing a, a white costume, because you'd need it to be white. It'd also need to be the same girth. Yeah. Of muscle build and so they stuff. don't so they don't grab through. Well, so they don't right? grab through, and so they, they come in contact properly. And also, so when you when you've got a dark suit coming up to a white suit, you'd want the same bounce because that suit would be throwing off light. A camera guy couldn't film this without having somebody really there, really doing all the performance. Everybody would be terrified of shooting that cape on set. It didn't move like a normal cape, but it's a magic cape. Magic capes go a long way. Well, the main thing there is that like it's spinning very quickly, but not going outwards. You know, you have the classic shot of the dancers spinning and their dress goes outwards into like a little like disc blade, but his doesn't. It just kind of goes, and I think that's creatively motivated by what's happening versus like, oh, that's not physics level real. I'd really want to see the, the outtakes of a real cape when they did 37 takes and the capes like caught around him. Like, cut, cut, cut. <laughs> There's a scene from Attack of the Clones that I wanted to take another look at. I remember watching this in the, in the movies and like people went ape. Dude, I had never been so hyped in a movie <laughs> before. So of course, uh, there's a bunch going on here, but what I really wanted to talk about was the intricacies of Yoda's animation. There's a lot in this movie that is dated, that's understandable, but I specifically want to get your impression of Yoda's animation and his clothing. What well you have. I had the benefit of the beginning of my career. I actually learned how to um, do old fashioned optics. So like the original Star Wars were done where they would bend light through lenses and then they would combine different elements. It's all about lenses. It's all about the imperfections of lenses and all that sort of stuff. And then comes along the Star Wars movies and they basically go all in on digital. And so what happens is you end up with an image that's like perfect from the top left to the bottom right corner all the way through it. And as a consequence, Something that's perfect like that really shocks you when you first see it. Frank Oz would animate Yoda and the way he could move the Yoda, we got used to it. It's like it became in our genetic code to watch something. And so he can move the puppet in strange ways. And when he moves it, they mentioned the, you know, the, the new ones when they did Yoda. They made sure the ears were like jiggling around just like they did when the puppets did it. Because the, the digital one, they didn't do it because they were animating him because they thought, well, his ears, that was a fake puppet. If this was a real character, it wouldn't have the little ears doing that on the end. They put it back in for the last three. They put the little really? ears you know, bouncing around. One of the things that was interesting about this is that animation has kind of, there's multiple styles, but there's like fluid 
perfectly everything moving and fluid and all that sort of stuff. But on a character like Yoda, I find it a little strange, I must admit. It's too fluid. <clears throat> Yeah, they had, like, having Yoda do all those flips and stuff was creating, like, these really intense gimbal lock issues for the animation. They had to create this whole new rig for him to be able to actually do that. Yeah. And that shot there where Dooku jumps up, completely CG. Really? Uh-huh. So, the beginning of the shot, the big reveal of Yoda whipping out his lightsaber. Ooh. You know, we're, we're also distracted by the cool lightsaber moments, but there's so much going on on top of that. Primarily, the marrying of animation and simulation. Right. Specifically with his robe you know that you start out animating yoda where he like reaches over he pulls back the his robe to get the lightsaber mm -hmm. but then you have to actually simulate the robe on top of that and that's going to be a direct response to that animation but it's not going to be perfect so then you get the simulation back and you're like oh but now the animation isn't quite translating as much so then you have to then reanimate his movement to match the simulation that was done on that animation. And then you do it again by re-simming the cloth, and then you go back and fix the animation again, and it's kind of like this back and forth iteration until you kind of get these things working, because especially 20 years ago, there weren't really systems in place to really just hit a button and be like, all right, I animated this thing, and now the cloth will just work. And so, yeah, shout out to Juan Luis and Tim Harrington for doing these shots here, and that was just something I never saw in any behind the scenes. They were talking about it online. I thought it was really cool. That type of principle still applies today, despite the better tools, you know? It's like going like, back and forth yeah, until like, it gets a little bit better, a little bit better, until you get to like right at the end, you're like, oh, this is good enough. Yeah, you know? basically what you want to over enunciate. So basically what happens is they would have done the reveal and then they would have handed that over to the cloth guys. And then they would have done the cloth, but then it would have hidden the animation. So maybe what you would have done is pushed his shoulder forward a little bit more, revealed a little bit more, given a pause, because the animator wouldn't have been working with the cloth. The irony is, is we are constantly sticking parts of costumes to the actor so that it stops obscuring them. Hair is a big one. Uh -huh. Like you'll end up have asking the actor to do something and they'll move and the hair will just go Phew, like that. And you're like, okay, we can't see your performance. So we end up holding hair back in certain areas so that when they do that particular movement, so it's the same principle, except it's a digital version of it. Like if this was a real little green Jedi on set and he had a real robe, they would have gone, we can't see your hand. Do you mind? We're just going to tape that yeah. up there. They would have totally have taped it there. And they would have gone, you know what? They would have done seven different takes of him doing the reveal. They would have gone, hold it a little longer. Give us more purpose, more purpose in that. You know, so it's exactly <laughs> basically doing a digital version of it except you're now making what on visual effects where you can do anything but really what you need to do is base it on re real life and what the decisions you make for the storytelling point of view i saw another example and love death and robots the episode called the witness which i'm a massive fan of it the style of it is incredible but the costume work in that i think is using um, some pretty amazing new tech that you can actually get off the shelf yourself. Wait, 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 hold up, hold up. Are you saying we're about to take a look at Love, Death, and Robots, one of our most requested things ever? Yeah, I'm a huge fan. I mean, I'm a huge fan as well. I love both seasons, and season three's coming out soon, and this was a particularly awesome episode in the first season. It's beautiful to look at. Yeah, it's got a very cool aesthetic for Absolutely. sure. Absolutely. I'm a huge fan of this and Arcane is yeah. like the, the uh, just the color work and the layout work and amazing animation, just amazing animation. I guess it's motion capture slash maybe it's hand animated. Probably a mix of both. I think it's a mix and it's all stylized and yet it weirdly has this photorealistic feel to it. Like look at that crumpled jacket that uh -huh. she's got when she gets in and then puts a cloth bag over the top of it, which <laughs> then folds down on the, the weight of the other one. Yeah, these days there's a program called Marvelous Designer that's mostly used for like designing clothing for characters in a digital environment. And I guess it also does very good cloth simulations as well. You can't just have a cloth stick to a body perfectly. It's gonna crinkle in certain ways. It's gonna move with its own momentum in certain ways. Yeah, it's interesting actually, you know, when you work in real superhero films and so on, they end up trying to remove the imperfections. And you know, there's sort of, we, we might be on a, a point now where we're going a little bit more and, and leaving some of those imperfections in there. Everybody had this vision of the Spider-Man suit and the Spider-Man suit looked a particular way with the comics. And when you can't 
do that in real life, you felt like you were compromising. So they would go in and fix it or potentially do digital bodywork. In this one, what's lying underneath is that girl moving around. She's wearing like this skin tight clothing, but it's all creasing right where it needs to go. And you're yeah. just naturally leaving that happen. The render engine is very photorealistic, but all of the texture work is stylized. And that combination is creating this really cool aesthetic. Every frame is like this. And Arcane did the same thing. Every frame is just a beautiful single frame. Might want to probably not show that, probably. <laughs> yeah. Well, okay, I guess that was on the website. <laughs> not on YouTube. Subscribe for that. <laughs> <laughs> All of these shows are, are really trying to push the edge of like what's aesthetically possible in a movie because, you know, for the longest time, it was either what you could film or what you could draw and then eventually what you could render but they all kind of existed in these separate categories and so I think it really started with Enter the Spider-Verse of starting to kind of merge those sort of categories together. Anyway. <laughs> Have fun whoever edits this. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Hey I know you got some comments in mind that you want to type down in the comment section below so you might as well just do that right now. About what? I don't know, just got comments in general. Right, about good things. How's the video going so far? On a scale from one to 10, how, how good is this video? Leave a comment down below. <laughs> Anybody that wants to hear more Australian accent, comment down below, I'll be back. Thank you so much for hitting that subscribe button, dingling that bell. <laughs> <laughs> but also check out the Ponisher channel, Clint's personal YouTube channel. If you want to learn more about how to do visual effects, how to break into the industry, Clint's got tons of tutorials and videos to kind of just show you everything you need to know. Thanks, Ren. That was, that was really nice. Dude, you're almost at a million subscribers now. I Ooh. think it's going to happen this year. And I finally got my email switched over so it's not the email that doesn't exist anymore. Hope We'll see. We'll see. We'll so see. you better help out Clint by making him hit a million. Come learn some VFX with me. It'll yeah. be a good time. <laughs> so Joe, is there anything that you would like our viewers to see? Since last time, um, you guys uh, really gave us some love when it came to a little short film I made with my son. And uh, we thought we'd probably come up with a sequel. He doesn't fit into the car anymore, so that's no longer an option. But we were thinking he's really into a foil board and we built one at home and we want to convert it to electric. And uh, we'll show you uh, a foil boarding uh, Koala Kana 2, which we hope to uh, people will enjoy as much as they did the last one. Joe, dude, it was, it was a treat to be on the couch with you again, man. Thank you so much for coming down and doing this. I love hanging out with you guys. This is, this is fun. <laughs>